It's good to be with you this evening. The song was very encouraging. It never let me go. Huh. What a thought. <laughs> Enjoyable thought. You take your Bibles and turn them to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. In our congregation have been studying through the book of Galatians. And I uh, believe it's been a very uh, great blessing. To me, it's been a blessing. But I also believe it's been a blessing to everyone uh, in our congregation uh, come to this portion of Scripture. And I thought it'd be good. Uh, I'll pray the Lord bless it to you as He has to us. If you look in... Uh, Let's begin our reading in verse 13. The Apostle says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now the apostle at this point in has concluded this error in the church of Galatia, that the, the Galatian church had taken on circumcision as a necessity, as though it was to be superimposed upon the righteousness of Christ, that they had to be circumcised in order to be saved. And all up until this point, Paul has already proven this truth that Christ alone is our salvation. He had preached that the justification was by the grace of God, listen, through the faith of Jesus Christ. It's a very important statement in this book. The faith of Jesus Christ. Our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption is all through the faith of Jesus Christ. It is by the operation of His work alone. This is the cause and means of all our justification before God. And our obedience has nothing to do with this. The Christ in His work was victorious. This is the glory and the beauty of the Gospel is that the work is finished. There's no more work to be done. Jesus said, it is finished. This, this separates it separates the gospel from all other supposed gospels. In every other supposed gospel, there's something left for you to do. In this gospel, all is accomplished. This is the wonderful glory of it. If anything's left up to us, there would be no hope for us. But the hope is this, it's done. Christ is successful. He has accomplished our redemption. In Hebrews 10, it tells us the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Wherefore, when He cometh into the world, He says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. What is He saying? There's no pleasure in the law. No pleasure in our obedience. Then said I, Christ. This is what Christ said. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. To do what? To do thy will, O God. This is his purpose. To do the will of God. And by doing so, he said, I taketh away the first that he may establish the second. He accomplished the law. He satisfied the law to establish the covenant of grace. In verses 10 through 14 of that, he says this. I don't want to misquote it because it's so beautiful. I was thinking I could probably quote it, but I'm gonna, my mind is not necessary. My mind's kind of rattled with the traffic still, so give me a, give me a chance here. Let's see. In uh, chapter uh, 10 and verse uh, 11, he says, 
I'm in mean, chapter 10 and verse 10. He says, by the which will. I come to do thy will. By the which will. We are, what? Sanctified. By the will of God we are made holy. How? Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How often? Once. Jesus Christ offered Himself once. How often are you sanctified? Once. When was I sanctified? I was sanctified in eternity by God's sovereign election. I was sanctified by the death of Jesus Christ. I was made holy. Made holy. And he goes back to the law. Every priest standeth daily ministering often the same times, the same sacrifices that can never take away sin. But this man. This is what we preach. This man. Not this man. This man. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, he sat down. This is beautiful. He's, in the old tabernacle, there was, there was not a chair. You know that? There was no chair to sit down because they were never done. But he sat down on the right hand of God, henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by his one offering, one offering. He hath perfected. How long? Forever. Them that are what? Sanctified. <laughs> Them that are sanctified. This is what Christ does. The great day of atonement is a beautiful picture of that, isn't it? The high priest represented who? Israel. Did he represent anybody else? No. He represented Israel. Picture of Christ. Christ only represented His people as their high priest. And Christ is not just pictured as the high priest. you got two, two goats. One's not enough to picture what He was going to do. Two goats. He took the scapegoat. He confessed the sins of, on the head of that scapegoat. Where were our sins confessed by God? Where were they placed by God? For God hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You remember what happened to that scapegoat? That strong man. Who's that? That's Christ too. <laughs> it, it, aren't you getting the picture in the volume of the book is written to me? He's a strong man who carried our sins. Who bore our sins in His own body. And you can see that the beautiful picture of this, the strong man's carrying that goat with all the sins of Israel away. And as he goes, he gets smaller and smaller and smaller until he's what? Gone. Where's your sin? Gone. He bore them away. And then what do you do? You see that strong man coming back without what? Without sin. Isn't that what Christ did when He rose from the dead? But that wasn't enough because that was bloodless, right? That was a bloodless picture. The other goat must be sacrificed. This is a picture of His offering. The sin offering. He offered Himself to God. He offered His blood for our sins. And you remember that high priest would take that blood and he would take it into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God. That's exactly what Christ did for, our, for us. He offered Himself and brought His blood into the presence of God. And God was forever satisfied. My sins didn't escape. I didn't escape. My sins, my sins, God didn't sweep my sins under the rug. He actually paid for them. All of them. All of them. And you remember the, how do you know that the, the, the high priest offering was successful? Well, he came out of there. If he, what, if he didn't bring the right blood, he was going to be killed. But you know he was successful when he came out of the grave. Christ atoned for the sins of His people. And this is our justification. I like that in Jeremiah chapter 50. It says, In those days and at that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for. Now who's seeking my iniquity? Who's looking for it? 
Well, I don't care if you're looking for it. God's looking for it. And what does God say? He says, it shall be sought for and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah and they shall not be found. Why? For I will pardon whom I reserve. You know who he's going to pardon? Whom he reserves. Everyone Christ died for is pardoned. Everyone. Not one missing. Not one missing. And Jesus made this statement clear. Now then that's what happened in eternity. That's what happened when Christ died. And what happens in time is this. That everyone Christ died for will come to Him. Without a doubt, not one will be missing. You're just talking about the church and its fullness. It's full all the time. Don't mistake that. The church is always full. The Lord is saving as many as He ordains to save. And not one more and not one less. The church is always full. It don't appear full. I don't, don't really care what it seems to our eyes. It is full. Jesus said this, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. So, who's not going to come? He said, All the Father giveth me shall come to me. And I will raise him up at the last day, and this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all he had given me, I should lose nothing. Nothing. This is what he had dealt with in the very part, first part of this, that justification, sanctification, redemption, is all by the faith and work of Jesus Christ. And the law has nothing to do with it. Our obedience to the law has nothing to do with it. In fact, he says this in chapter 5. He says, if you add one thing to Christ, Christ shall profit you nothing. That's a very plain statement, is it? You don't have to be a great scholar to understand that. In verse 4, Christ should become of no effect to you, whosoever you are, that are justified by the law. You want to be justified by the law? You want to add the law and superimpose the law onto the righteousness of Christ? Listen, Christ shall profit you nothing. I don't care who you are, Paul said. I don't care if you're a preacher, a deacon. I don't care what you, what with theologian, whatever you are. Christ will profit you nothing. And so now he gets down and he's done the error. The error is now done away with. The light has shined out of darkness and now it is clear. Now in this church, there were many who followed after that error. But there are many that did not follow after that error. And now in verse 13, the apostle is moving his attention from those who were in error to those who were faithful. Because he knew this was going to happen. That when those who failed, repented, that those who were faithful had in their nature to look down on those who were in error. And look what he said in verse 13. Brethren. Now who's he talking to? He's talking to believers. Brethren, you that are faithful. You that have been called into liberty. You that are in steadfast in liberty. Don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. The occasion to the flesh was to look down on them. It was to think themselves superior to their brothers who had fallen. But rather in love serve one another. He warns them not to bite and devour one another. Why? Why would He say that? Because it is in our old nature to bite and devour one another. And so then, seeing that salvation, He says this, I say then walk in the Spirit. What is it to walk in the Spirit? It is to walk by faith and love. Because that's the law of every believer. Every believer is under a law. We're under the law of faith and love. John says his commandments are not grievous to us. They're not grievous. Is faith grievous to you? 
Is love grievous? No. This is our law to walk in the Spirit. Now then you that believe, and, and Paul's going to address the nature of everyone who believes. The condition now of every one of us who have been saved by that wonderful, perfect work of Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit comes and regenerates us, when He gives us life and faith, there is something that takes place in us. There's something that takes place in us. There is a divine effect. And that's what, if I have a title of this, it is the effects of grace. The effect of grace. Now I've got several things that every believer experiences when he believes in Christ. The first thing is this. The moment we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, a warfare ensues. A warfare. Every believer understands this. And he is, he, he's bringing this home to, to those who were faithful and to those who were in error. This, is, this happens to us all. He's uniting us in this. There's a spiritual warfare. Look at this in verse 17. He wants us to walk in the Spirit so we not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, why would He want us to do that? Because the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh and these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Everyone born of the Spirit, you know this. You now have a new nature. Everyone that is born of the Spirit of God has a new nature. And this nature that you have is holy. It's holy. Now don't go look in the mirror and try to find it. You won't. Don't follow me around and try to look for it. You won't see it. Nonetheless, it's there. It's there. I'll show it to you. Go, go to 1 John. Go to 1 John. Now, you're going to scratch your head at this, but this is just so. 1 John chapter 3. Look at verse 6. John says, Whoso abideth in him. Isn't that what the Lord said? Abide in me and I in you. How do we abide in Christ? This is only through faith. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are abiding in Him. If you believe on Him tonight, you are abiding in Him. Now listen to what He says about you. Whosoever abideth in Him sinneth not. Conversely, whoso sinneth hath not seen Him, neither known Him. Can you, can you reconcile that with your experience right now? <laughs> you think you can you try to find that? Well, maybe John made some, maybe I can maybe can explain this away somehow. No, because John doubles down and says it again, chapter 5 and verse 18. Look at that. This is something we know. John said, we know this. It's something every one of you know. You that believe, it's something you know. We know that whosoever is born of God, what? Sinneth not. When I read those, I know that that contradicts everything I feel, everything I think. But you know what? It seems that there's a contradiction in the book of John. Go to chapter 1. Look what John says in verse 8. He says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now which is it? It seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not as if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But there is no contradiction. 
Why? Because that which is born of God sinneth not. That which is born of flesh always sins. You and I are creatures now of two natures. The Apostle Paul in that beautiful chapter in Romans 7 just being blatantly honest and open. He said, In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. You as a believer, can you identify? Now then, I think you can identify more with that than the other, but you know it's true. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And so then everyone that is born of God, seeing now we have a nature that is absolutely without sin, and a nature that can only sin, what begins then is this text that Paul is describing in verse 17. The flesh, that nature that you and I are born with, that sinful nature that can only sin, always, Todd said this, I cannot not sin. That's all it does is see it. So that which is born of flesh, he says, lusteth against the Spirit. This is not the Holy Spirit, but is the work of the Holy Spirit, the new nature, and the Spirit against the flesh, and they are contrary. Listen, one to the other. If you got one and another, you got two. Isn't that right? If there's one and another, then there's two. And what's the result? You can't do what you want to. In every believer we desire to live after righteousness. Sin is sin is a pain and a misery to my soul. It has not brought me one good effect, not one good thing. And yet how to stop it, I can't find. In the Song of Solomon chapter 6, when the Lord looks upon the Shulamite, the Shulamite's a picture of the church, He says, when we look upon the Shulamite, what shall we find? Here it is. As it were a company of two armies. You that believe, is it not so with you? J.C. Philpott said this concerning self. Self is the worst enemy of the believer because it is always continually with us. Satan is not omnipresent. We could shut out the world, but you can't shut out self. And so we know this in our nature. There doesn't dwell anything. But there is also another component of those who are believers in Christ. He says this. The fle- it says, but here is the hope of every believer. Though we struggle, though we have this internal conflict, yet he says this, if we are led of the Spirit, here's my hope, you're not under the law. So then the consequence of this struggle has nothing to do with my salvation. It's an effect of my salvation. Get that. It's the effect of it. It's not the cause of it. And so then my the flesh winning or the spirit winning doesn't have anything to do with my righteousness. That's something that's already been done. But it is something we face. It's something we do struggle with. And yet there is another. And then he begins to manifest these things here. Uh, if you look on down the apostle here, he's going to talk about the, what the flesh is. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest. The works of the flesh are are manifest. These are clear. These are clear. 
Now, and I want you to get this, because this is, I said this many times to our congregation, I want you to understand what the Apostle is doing here, so that you, the, the legalists will take these things and they'll say, uh, the, the works of the flesh are manifest, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, strife, wrath, sedition, and then they go looking for every, they're looking in you. They start looking for all this stuff in you. They say, ah, look, there's sedition. That's not what he's doing. The apostle is stating these facts concerning the flesh because he wants you to see these things are in you. These things are in my flesh. The flesh that lusts against the Spirit, and he, he wants you to internalize this, not external. Not looking at everybody else's adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, sedition, looking at your own. These things are in our own flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. This is sexual immoralities. And you remember our Lord told us that that, is, that could be done by a look. Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her committed adultery already in his heart. Idolatry. We think of idolatry as somebody bowing down to a little statue or something. Which it is. I, I read this the other day. Some, uh, uh, some Catholic priest holding this thing up and full of gold and diamonds. And he was weeping and... He, they ask him why he's crying. He says, I'm holding the Creator. Idolatry. But again, we're not to look outside, we're to look inside. How about putting our families above Christ? Idolatry is putting anything above Christ. That's what it is. Your family, your friends, your job. Who had not committed idolatry. Witchcraft. Well, I've not done that one, Pastor. Oh yeah? Anybody want to know the future? Anybody look for signs? Anybody superstitious? Witchcraft. Hatred. Well, we all did that. I did that on freeway. Coming over here. <laughs> Variance. That's an argumentative spirit. Anybody got that? Emulations. That's the ruin of others. Seeking the ruin of others. Just think about your politicians and see if you don't do that. Strife. Fault finding. Blaming. Quarreling. Seditions. Divisions. Civil and religious. Heresies. You know the root word of that is? Opinion. Anybody got an opinion? Well, God said this, but my, I think, okay, heresy. That's what that is. Simple. It's adding your opinion to what God said. That's heresy. And then the externalizing of these things is envying, murder, drunkenness, reveling, and such like. You know, we've got a whole book full of men examples of this, don't we? God's men. God's men. He paints them warts and all. He had numerous examples of believers guilty of these vile, vile uh, uh, things. Think of Lot. Got drunk and committed incest with his own daughters. Moses murdering a man thinking he did God a service. Aaron committing idolatry and allowing a fornication to, among the congregation. An orgy in front, of, in front of his idols. That was God's high priest. Samson committing adultery and then suicide. Killing himself. David murder, adultery. Job, self-righteousness. See, we have all these examples. Why? Because the same thing that's in these men are in here. This is my flesh we're talking about. 
This is the mark of every true believer is this, that we know we are the sinner. You know what the publican said? Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. The sinner. So this is when God comes in power and opens our hearts and minds. This is the first thing we reveal is, is our sin, our need of Christ. Have you, ever overcome, have you overcome these things? This is what religion teaches. Religion teaches you that you can overcome these things. That you can get past this. I knew a man that was, he, he ruined his life, committed adultery, and divorce, the whole, the whole thing ruined, his reputation ruined. Couldn't find any relief, couldn't find any comfort. And religion came in and said, oh, you just need to join this group over here and we'll, we'll all talk about it. And then, then we'll just, we, and it'll get better and you're, you're pretty soon you won't even have those desires anymore. Our Lord said this, that which is born of flesh is what? It's flesh. But what is our hope? Our hope is this, that the blood of Christ cleanseth us from all our sins. I like that word. All the words that use ETH are present perfect tense. John says, His blood cleanseth us from all our sins. It means it has cleansed me from all my sins. It is right now cleansing me from all my sins. And it shall forever cleanse me from all my sins. Isn't that what you need? Don't you need cleansing now? What if we had to take our worship tonight as our acceptance with God? Don't you need cleansing from your worship? Isn't sin mixed with all you do? And so what is our hope? It is the blood of Christ. What is our restraint? This is, religion tells you the, the law is your restraint. What is your restraint? Listen, to the believer, the love of Christ is our restraint. And that what Paul said it is the love of Christ. Not my love for Christ. That doesn't restrain anything. It is the love of Christ that constraineth us from fulfilling the lust of our flesh. So this is the result. It is a constant perpetual warfare in every believer. And now let us look and see the other part of this. And not only that we have the old man of sin, but there is a new man. This, that's, that, I know that was a downer. <laughs> but there, there is hope here. Look, because there is a new man. There is a new man in every believer. And look what Paul says comes out of the new man. He says this in verse 22. He says... But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And so this is true of every believer. Yes, we have an old nature that's full of sin. We have an old nature that can't do anything but sin. But I'm telling you this, we also have a new nature that cannot sin at all. And this is the fruit of the Spirit. I, I thought of an analogy today to try to figure, give you, give you something to, to look at. You plant a seed. It's an, it's an apple tree seed. You plant it in the ground. And it grows. It grows. And it has branches and it has leaves. But you don't know it's an apple tree until you see what? I'm not, I'm not a you know, 
a tree connoisseur so I could see a tree and it would just look like a tree. Until what? I saw an apple on it. And then I could say, yep, that's an apple tree. That's an apple tree. Now did the apple make the tree an apple tree? No. It just showed me that it was. The fruits of the Spirit don't make me holy. They're just evidence that I am. They're just the fruit of it. The nature is created of God. That's what Paul says. Uh, listen, listen what Paul says in, about your new nature. He says, put off the old man and his deeds. Uh, isn't it wise to put off those old deeds that we just mentioned? Of course it is. Put on the new man, he said. Now, how do we do that? We do that by faith. We do that by faith because this is what God says is created. He said, put on the new man which is created. Now you don't have to be a scholar to understand that word. It means something wasn't there before and poof, God created it. God made it. Created after God. After the image of God. And listen to what he says. In true holiness. I don't know if there's any other kind, but if it's holiness, it's got to be true holiness. But that's how it's created, after God, in true holiness. And listen to what happens, what's the fruit then of this? Every believer will love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. First of all, love for Christ. Love for Christ. So, simple question. Do you love Christ? Do you love His person? And you can't love somebody you don't know. Isn't that right? You can't love somebody you don't know. Paul said, How shall they call on Him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's great. But how are you going to call on somebody you don't know? How are you going to call on Him unless somebody tells you about it? Has, has somebody told you of, his, of this person who is God manifest in the flesh? Do you love that? I do. He is God. Very God. Manifest in the flesh. Come to redeem His people from their sins. You know what the angel said when He came into the world? He shall call His name Jehovah saves. Why? He's Jehovah. And He's going to save. He's going to save, listen, His people from their sins. When He came into this world, He lived a righteous life before God and men. And He died on a cross for the sins of His people. You love that? I'll tell you this. Only one group of people like that. Sinners. Sinners like that. I need that blood. Without it, I'll die. And in love He gave it. And the question is this. Do you love His success? Do you like hearing about how successful He is? My whole soul depends upon His success. I love to hear how successful He is. I need to be reminded of it because the flesh is dragging me the other way. How often do you say, "Tis a point how long to know often it causes anxious thoughts. Do I love the Lord or no? Am I His or am I not? Do you love Him? Why do you love Him? Why do you love Him? There's a whole bunch of people in this world don't love Him at all. Simply this. I love Him because He first loved me. No other reason. I don't love Him because I'm smarter than you. I don't love Him because I'm better than you. I don't love Him because I'm, I'm good or this or that. I love Him because He loved me. He chose me. I didn't choose Him. He chose me. For the life of me, I can't figure out why.
He put me in Christ. He in love died in my stead. And He in love called me to Himself. There is no wonder I love Him. Because He loved me. I like this hymn, we sing it often. Tis not that I did choose thee, for Lord that could not be. This heart would still refuse thee, had thou not chosen me. Thou from sin that stained me, has cleansed and set me free. Of all thou hast ordained me, that I should live to thee. To a sovereign mercy called me, and taught my opening mind. The world had else enthralled me to heavenly glories blind. My heart owns none before thee. For thy rich grace I thirst. This knowing if I love thee, thou must have loved me first. Do you love him? How often have we Again, love is just a fruit of what He's done because it's not, you don't depend on your love, do you? You don't dare put any weight in it, do you? Why? Because your love fluctuates. Doesn't it? We're like Peter. Peter one minute said, Lord, I don't care if they all betray you, I'll die with you. Now we, we, we chuckle at that because we know what happens in just a minute. But at that moment, I guarantee you he was sincere. How often have you been sincere in this? Though everybody forsake you, I won't. And it wasn't a couple of hours later and he denied him three times. I know Peter loved him. But Peter struggled with the same thing we do. The flesh against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh and our love often fails. But here's my hope. His love never fails. He came to Peter. Peter, do you love me? Yeah. Yes, Lord. Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. Second time, Peter, do you love me? Oh, how this must begin to sting. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. And the third time, Peter, do you love me? Peter being grieved. Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. What kept Peter loving him? Was it Peter's love? What keeps you loving him? It's his love for you. <laughs> it's his love for you. I got plenty more. Man, I got plenty more. I'll go over this. Uh, I'll go quickly. These last two, and we'll, we'll close it up. Uh, joy. Joy. Every believer has joy. And I'm not talking about the joy that passes. This fleeting, fancy thing that just happens. We, we have a, a, a young mother in our congregation. And man, I, I haven't seen a baby in, a, in, in our congregation in a long time. And I, I'm watching her look at that little thing and the joy that comes out of her by just, you know, and I'm watching it. I said, man, I'm so happy for you. And it's going to go like that. Why? Because the joys of earth are fleeting this is not the joy we're talking about here the joy that the believer has is one that is spiritual it has nothing to do with the circumstances in our life it has nothing to do with the the providences that happen to us our joy does not stem from those things but rather it is a spiritual and an eternal joy why because our joy is christ Peter said this, Whom having not seen, you, what? You love. And though you don't see Him, yet believing, what do you do? 
you rejoice. You rejoice in what? In whom? You rejoice in Him. With joy unspeakable, with full of glory. Christ is our joy. The psalmist writes this. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The Bible is very good at being specific. <laughs> you notice that? Have you noticed it's not general? Specific. Not your joy in the Lord is your strength. Why? Because the same thing that happens to your love happens to your joy. Doesn't it? So there's no strength in your joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Now what's His joy? What is the happiness of God? What is the joy of God? Listen to this. It's to save you. You know that, that that is the joy of God to save you? It is His pleasure. I can't, it's like unfathomable to my mind that He actually rejoices to save me. Not till I'm there can I fully understand that. In Zephaniah chapter 3, listen to this. The Scripture says He sings over you. When I was dating my wife, Cheryl, when I was dating her, every love song, <laughs> every love song that came on the radio pictured my relationship immediately. I just sang. God rejoices over you. Man, if that won't put you in the dust, nothing will. He rejoices over you with singing. In that day when you stand before Him, our Lord Jesus said this, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We all love our children and we, we pray to leave an inheritance to them, but how often do we want to take it away? <laughs> they do something bad. Is, their lives are a mess and what do we want to do? Well, they ain't getting that. My God says, I give it to you with all my heart. I give it to you. This brings joy. And the last thing is this, peace. Peace. Every believer loves. Every believer has the joy. And every believer has peace. I'm going to skip over here. Go to Philippians chapter 4 and I'm gonna, I'll close with this one. Philippians Philippians chapter 4. The apostle says this in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. There it is. There's joy. You can rejoice in that always. When are you supposed to rejoice? Huh? You're supposed to wait for a special occasion? Special circumstance? Everything going well? Then rejoice? No. Rejoice always. Why? Because you have, you have joy. Always. It's given to you. Again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Isn't that good? <clears throat> what are you to be anxious about? If it's God's good pleasure to save you, what are you be anxious about? If God gave you His Son, which is the greatest gift He can give you, how shall He not with Him freely give us all things? If nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, what do you have to be anxious about? You are. <laughs> you are. We are. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, 
You know what? You can't be thankful and murmur at the same time. Can you? You can't. Can't do it. Let your request be made known unto God. And listen, the peace of God which passes understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Now, how can you understand the peace of past understanding? Now, so I was always confused by that. I didn't really understood. I mean, that was really hard to grasp because obviously you can't understand this kind of peace. So then what's the point of dwelling on it or thinking about it? It's not what it means. I got this the other day and it was just, just open this text to me very, very clear. When you're a little, little child and you have two loving parents, you do not understand the intricacies of how they make the money to buy the food. You don't understand the sacrifices they make to give you the food. You don't understand how they have to go out and get it and pay for it and bring it home and you don't know how they cook it. You don't know the, how, the intricacies of all these things that have, they have to do in order to get that food on the table. You don't understand any of it. All you know is this, and you're at peace with this, that you're going to eat. You're at peace. You know when it's dinner time as a little kid, you run to the table and you sit there expecting food. You're at peace. You don't know how it is they buy the clothes. You don't know how it is they go shopping. You don't care. You don't understand it. All you know is they love you and they're going to put clothes on your back. That is a peace past understanding. You don't need to understand how it is. You just have peace. It's going to be all right. That's exactly how it is. We have peace. We know this. I don't know what God's doing. I just know He's going to do it. I don't know how it's all going to work out, but I really don't care. I know this. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose, and I have peace with that. Now, is your flesh going to fight against that? Yep. I struggled all the way here. And yet at the end, God gave me such peace to know that I am working all things together for your good. And you don't have to understand how it happens. You don't need to know how the sausage is made. You just don't need to know. And we're anxious because we, we want to know. It's past your understanding. Why would you want to know? But this peace came at a price, didn't it? Colossians 1.21 Christ hath made peace by the blood of His cross. I don't understand the fullness of that. I, I know it. And I believe it. And it is my peace. I don't understand the fullness of it yet. That's alright. I don't have to. You don't have to know everything. You just got to know Him. You know Him. You know everything you need to know. And these are the things that are in believers. And they're... they're Okay, I got more, but I ain't gonna. I got. I, I'm just gonna quit. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I gotta got quit. <laughs> I know, but uh, these things, uh, gentleness, meekness, these are things that are faith, uh, our love, joy, and peace always yield meekness, long suffering, and gentleness. If you have those three, those other three pour out that. And then faith, faith ties it all together. You have to have faith to have love, joy, and peace. You have to have faith to have meekness, gentleness, temperance. You have to have that. It just ties it all together. But listen to me. All these things are not are in you. You who believe, these are in you. They're not the measure that you want, but they are in you. They're the fruit of the Spirit that God gives you. And you know, the only person that doesn't see him is you. <laughs> you the believers, I don't. 
I don't see. <laughs> I see the flesh. I don't see these others. Not really meant to. If you saw them, you'd be proud. But God does show them to each other, doesn't He? I see yours. I see yours. I see your love and your faith and your meekness and your gentleness. I just don't see mine. It's all right. I see Christ. That's all I need to see. I pray God bless you.